Um, so a really warm welcome to you. Uh, very much appreciated you taking a couple of hours out of your day um, and hopefully you're going to get something of a uh, real value today. Now, let me just let somebody else in. Um, please do stick around to the end. At the very end I'm going to um, do a random draw from everybody who registered um, and we'll send five copies uh, of my new book to uh, five people at random. Okay fantastic. So uh, if you've got any questions um, I'll try and take some as we go. Um, I think I know most of the questions that are going to be asked, but what I'm going to try and do is if we can try and take some questions at the end, that will be absolutely fantastic. Or if you'd rather not ask a question um, during the middle of this, uh, feel free to drop me uh, an email at the end as well. So I'm just still letting one or two more people coming in. <laughs> Okay, good stuff. So I'm going to uh, share some slides. Um, halfway through, I'm going to introduce uh, Mike Legasic. Some of you know, um, Mike has um, already set his scorecard up and um, be interested to share some of his um, observations on, on how he's found and the sort of unexpected things that have, that have come out of using scorecard marketing. Still got more joining us. Let me just let them in. Okay, I think we'll crack on. So let me just share the screen here for you. So can everybody see a slide? Just give me a thumbs up if you can see a slide. Fantastic, good stuff. Okay, that's great. So we're, we're here to talk about uh, scorecard marketing and which for a lot of people is a, is a fairly new uh, concept. Uh, I know for some of you, you probably haven't even heard of it at all. Um, you, if you're on Facebook, you may well have seen a couple of financial planning firms advertising their scorecard at you. One or two of you may have had a, a little go through, put a false email in uh, <clears throat> just to get a sense of, of what it's all about. So um, scorecards in terms of their use online are still very, very new. Um, but it is a very old fashioned concept which has been brought kicking and screaming uh, into the modern age. So let me ask you by asking a really simple question, how useful would it be to know the name and the financial planning situation of everyone who visits your website. Um, now, most financial advisors would say cautiously, well, yeah, I reckon that would be quite a, a useful thing to know. What's interesting is that most financial advisors don't even know how many people are visiting their website uh, on a regular basis, let alone who's visiting their website. Um, so we're going to have a little bit, we're going to put some of this into context first, just to look at the way marketing has changed for financial advisors <clears> and why scorecards are something that I strongly recommend that, uh, that you look at in a bit more detail. Now, I did some research. Uh, some of you may have seen this um, in the Facebook group where I asked financial advisors, when you receive a lead, to what extent do you need further information? And the long and short of it is basically that almost everybody needs more data, more information before can they can decide whether or not this is a client they want to take on. Um, and this is the case wherever you get your leads from, whether they're from unbiased, whether you're doing a seminar, whether you're at a networking event, whether you purchase a lead, for the most part, you still actually need to just delve a little bit deeper before you can, you can find out uh, if it's somebody that you want to take on. So what is a scorecard? Uh, and we're gonna get sort of deeper and deeper and deeper. Fundamentally, it's a question, answer, and analysis tool, which sits right on the pathway that people follow when they're searching for advisors. So if somebody is at a dinner party and they've been recommended uh, to talk to a particular financial advisor, a journey begins. In the old days, they used to just phone the advisor up long before the internet. If you were given a recommendation, that recommendation <coughs> mate of yours was usually good enough and you would just phone them up. These days, people do a lot more research. They go onto Google, they go onto LinkedIn and they check them out. And quite often when they're on Google, for example, they'll find the website of the firm they're looking for, but they'll also see lots of other websites while they're there. So they will inevitably get distracted. They might even find an article or a blog, or they might find a YouTube channel, they might find a podcast. And so some might not even end up talking to a financial advisor at all because they can figure this stuff out for themselves. But what a, what a scorecard does, it actually sits on that research route, that pathway that people are following when they are actually doing some research for financial advisors. 
when they go through the scorecard, it gives them massive value in the form of a report based on answers to questions. That in turn then creates real curiosity in what you do for a living because your online uh, proposition looks fundamentally different from all the other financial advisors that have been looking at. From your point of view as the financial advisor, when someone goes through your scorecard, you not only do you get their name and their email address, as if you were doing some sort of free download, not only do you get that, but you get all the answers to their questions. Phenomenal data and insights into this person. It's like them filling in a fact find before you ever get to talk to them. And that puts you very much in the driving seat uh, as a financial advisor. And it's all in a GDPR compliant manner as well. So you've got people that go through your scorecard, you get all their data, and you can then literally look at the data they've given you, and you can follow different people up in different ways, in a, in a highly personalized way. And we'll go into this in, in more detail. And I would argue that what you're getting is the most highly qualified leads that you will ever get in your career as a financial planner. So this is what we're covering today, uh, kind of in two parts. First of all, how financial advisor marketing is changing, the problem with how we present ourselves online today, and how scorecards are seriously going to make a big impact in the world of financial planning. Not just in financial planning, in fact, in anyone who's in a sort of consultancy or a coaching type role, scorecards do not work for people who've got actual products like a car or like a widget or something shiny. Scorecards are really for people who need to get to know uh, people in depth before you can really help them. So we'll then be looking at what a scorecard is, uh, coming up with a theme for your scorecard, uh, the questions and the categories that you, that you put on your scorecard, uh, the results page that where people get their report and their observations, uh, how you can follow these up, and some surprising other ways that you can use scorecards in your business. For the most part, I kind of look at, uh, and I talk about scorecards like they're a lead generation tool, that they're a marketing tool. In actual fact, as time has gone by, I've realized that they, they have very much, they offer very much more and can very much add to your overall proposition as a financial planner. Um, and to the extent that this thing ends up as a new business asset, uh, for you. So uh, very briefly, a bit of background um, as to where I came from. I got started in financial services, working with financial advisors in 1978. Um, my dad um, asked me one afternoon, you know, what do you plan to do? Um, and he asked me that question because I didn't go to university. I didn't go to college. I just got my A-levels. Um, and I'd basically been bumming around rock concerts, taking photos. I'd started to do rock concert photography. Uh, those of you that are in our financial planning rocks group on Facebook will know that um, rock photography was, was something I was really, really excited about. Um, and so those of you that love your music, please check out financial planning rocks uh, on uh, Facebook. We have quite a lot of fun in there, but that's what I wanted to do. But my parents were having none of it. And my dad told me that I really needed to get a proper job. Um, and it came to a, a point where um, I had a moment in my life where I was actually photographing Blackfoot, um, Southern rock band at the Hammersmith Odeon, and they were recording their live album. And when the album cover came out, I was actually on the front cover. I think I was about 19, 18, 19 at the time. And there's me uh, right up the front there at the Blackfoot concert. And I thought, well, this is it. This is the pinnacle of my rock concert career. I think I will now go out and get a proper job. And I went down to the job centre in Dorking in Surrey and the nice lady gave me a 10 minute interview and uh, concluded that I was cut out for pension scheme administration. Uh, I had no idea what that was, but it gave me a free lunch and a salary. And I went to work here at uh, Milton Court. National Employees Life is now Unum for basically for those of you that, that uh, do a bit of PHI. And um, after about six months, they concluded that pension scheme administration was not really for me and that sales was more my thing. Um, and they packed me off to Croydon, where I became a broker consultant, a broker rep, an inspector, as we called them back then. Um, and my life changed. And for the next 20 years, I met 20 financial advisors every single week. 
Um, and I did that across that particular company and also with Zurich Life as well and for a short period with Liverpool Victoria. And I met literally tens of thousands of financial advisors over that particular period. I made some great friends, um, really interesting times. It was very different back then. Uh, you weren't called IFAs, you weren't called financial planners, you were all brokers, whether you just did life and pensions or whether you did a mo bit of motor insurance as well. But I met tens of thousands of financial advisors. Um, and, and I was eventually made redundant by Liverpool Victoria for the next 22 years. Uh, I've basically been an independent sales and marketing consultant for financial advisors. And I've worked with financial advisors all around the world. And I worked out the other day that I've now presented to over a million financial professionals um, around the world. Now, what's really interesting is I get to see all sorts of different business models. I get to see the way financial advisors market and promote their services. And there's some quite interesting themes that I've noticed. Now, I know one or two of you have got um, my book. This was in many ways a trip down memory lane going right back to 1978. Um, and this basically looks at the good, the bad and the ugly of financial advisor marketing, mostly focusing on the good. Um, my most recent book looks to the future and is very much focused on using data to market and promote your proposition as a financial planner, but also to market yourself in a very, very smart and intelligent way and to make your marketing very much more personalised. If you read any sort of marketing stuff at all, you'll have seen that marketing is really becoming more and more personalized because we can. Uh, in the old days, it was very much chuck enough out there and some of it will actually stick. These days, through digital technology, we, we can become very, very much more focused uh, on, on individual people and their very, very specific needs. Now, if we go back in time, there is a fundamental difference between the way financial advisors used to market themselves in the past to the way they market themselves today. And the difference is back then it was proactive. Today, it's pretty reactive. If we go back to the 70s and the 80s, this is how financial advisors used to market themselves. Good old fashioned old school stuff. Yeah. Leafleting. Remember those days? Sponsoring local things. Uh, I know Jeremy squibs on this particular call. I think, Jeremy, you sponsor a, a bowling club. Um, I think you'd, you down in Cornwall, I think you mentioned to me once it was the best money you've literally ever spent. Many of these old school marketing techniques still work. But the thing is, is we have to get off our backsides and go and do this stuff. With social media, I think we've become a bit lazy. Um, if you look at today's marketing, what have we got? It, it's all a bit dull, to be quite honest. Social media was, was billed by many, including myself, um, as a really big thing and a really exciting thing. But social media has changed really quite dramatically. To me, the only social platform that really works from a marketing perspective is LinkedIn right now. Google's pretty powerful for those of you who do Google advertising. We do a bit of directory listings and we have our websites. Um, however, we can still do some of these things as well as we come out of lockdown. Uh, people will be going back to networking events. People will be putting on seminars again. Those of you that know me uh, will have heard me say many times that probably the single most effective form of marketing and high quality lead generation for financial advisors is seminars. Um, newsletters, local sponsorships, and newsletters is an interesting one. Again, we send them out by email because it's quick, quick and easy. And frankly, it's a little bit lazy. Um, I know one or two financial advisors who are now going back to doing proper glossy paper newsletters. And my goodness, clients seem to value those so much more than an email that just drops into their, into their inbox. Uh, somebody's asked me, asked me a question. Yeah, Jeremy said uh, for his, his sponsorship of the local bowling club, uh, which was aimed at really the over 60s in Port Levin, £300. And that was for five years. Uh, Raj, yes, this is being recorded as well. So 300 quid for five years. Uh, oh, and a free game of bowls. So I would say that's pretty, pretty good return on your investment and pretty focused as well. You know, if your target market is people in their 60s and over, then putting a big old banner up at a bowling club is, is a pretty good idea as well. Um, so these are some of the other things we're doing. So 
in 2020, the, the, the marketing that we do is, is uh, very different from what it used to be, but um, we still have the potential to do some of the old school stuff that really does work. Just for, for interest sake, there's been some research done by both myself and Michael Kitts is over in the States in terms of uh, top strategies and best performing marketing for different types of advisors. For top performing advisors and for those of you that have been around for a while, clearly referrals are still at the top of the list. Although in actual fact, we could be doing our referrals so much better. We tend to be a little bit lazy when it comes to referrals. You know, we do a great job for a client and we kind of sit back and go, well, you know, we've done a great job. It's fairly inevitable that someone will refer us. And that indeed happens. But there are some ways to train clients how to refer us. Um, and I mention this every single time because it is such a good book. If you can get a copy of this book, Get More Referrals Now by Bill Cates. This is the book for financial advisors on how to train your clients and train your introducers to give you more and better quality leads. Uh, top performing advisors, particularly in the United States, are writing books like they're going out of fashion, seminars, uh, client events, web listings, uh, introducers, LinkedIn, search engine optimization, funnel websites and lead magnets, and those with a bit of cash to spend uh, hiring agencies and consulting. So that's for the top performing advisors. Um, if you're a new advisor, or maybe you're struggling a little bit, or you need a little bit of help, there are some low risk strategies uh, which will work for you. And again, referral mm. to the list, working with introducers, good old fashioned local advertising, um, local sponsorships, those sort of things. Seminars are really, really powerful. Um, networking, LinkedIn, we're starting to see more financial advisors in the UK starting to write their own books as well, which is, which is awesome. And good old fashioned, old school, non-digital. Keith Churchhouse of Chapters Financial Planning in Guildford, you know, his primary marketing activity for years and years was sponsoring a roundabout on the outskirts of Guildford. He also used to do the, the occasional uh, radio phone in. He'd go in as the local expert. But, you know, sponsoring a roundabout, I initially thought well, that's quite amusing. Um, but in actual fact, when you think about it, it's really, really smart because people, commuters driving into Guildford will see his name on the roundabout and tens of thousands of people every day will see his name and then they'll see it again when they go home at the end of the day. So good old fashioned stuff like that uh, really, really works as well. But what's interesting is if you look of these things, which ones are digital? And in both columns, fewer than half of them are digital. So <clears throat> old fashioned non-digital stuff really works well um, if you can get it focused on your ideal clients. This is what a lot of marketing people would have you believe we should be doing as financial advisors. Yeah, this just chucking content chucking our expertise out there all over the place all of the time every day is what we should be doing apparently. Now if you happen to know that your particular clients listen to a certain podcast then fine podcasting may be well. so I'm not got a problem with being quite focused about doing this but this idea that we should be doing all of this all the time is just nonsense. Um, I was doing it myself up until a couple of years ago because everyone said you need to be putting content out there. And I thought, okay, fine. Uh, any bit of expertise that I might have, I'll repurpose it and I'll put it out there all over the place. And I realized a couple of years ago, this is just nonsense. And I took the decision that I'm not going to give my um, so-called expertise away anymore. But what I am going to do is I'm going to put it into books. So the last year I've written about five books and I'm going to sell my expertise. Occasionally I'll give away a book uh, as a kind of lead magnet. And the difference that has made to my business has, has been amazing. It's given me so much more focus. So understand where your ideal clients hang out online. And then yes, put your focus into those particular areas because this in the long term, this approach just isn't sustainable. Now, I believe there are eight fundamental problems with financial advisor marketing right now. First of all, the referral process is changing. As we've seen, financial advisors, um, 
in many ways rely on referrals, but we're still looking for, for more and better qualities. And this is for the simple reason is, is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in the old days, somebody recommended you and they'd phone you up the next, they would phone you up the next day. These days, that process is different. If you're given a recommendation, we go onto Google, we go onto LinkedIn, we go onto Facebook, we go onto Twitter, and we look around just to see if we can get some sort of third party agreement. Um, and so we cannot anymore assume that referrals are just going to keep through coming in through our door unless we train our clients how to refer us. Today's consumers need proof of our expertise, credibility and value. And that could be in the form of um, high quality articles or books that you have written. Or maybe you have a, a very, very focused YouTube channel. People need some proof of your expertise. Why do they need that? Because most financial advisors' websites all look exactly the same. They all say the same thing. They all look great, but they all say the same thing. Um, most financial advisors don't have a formal marketing plan. Many financial advisors are not collaborating. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, it's a simple fact of life that most financial advisors are not in competition with each other. Uh, it's what, we're one of those professions, one of those industries where you're not actually in competition, even at a local level. I'm here in Cranley where we have uh, quite a purple patch of financial advisors, but none of those financial advisors are in competition with each other. Um, so how could you collaborate? I mean, one thing you could do is you could get together with other financial advisors in your town and you could create a website for sake of argument, which just lists you out. And each of you commit to writing one blog every quarter that you put on that website. Who will notice? Google will notice, okay? And it will make you more visible and it will make the financial advisors in your town, in your location, in your city, much more visible than you might otherwise done. So by collaborating together like that, working together, you can actually help each other. As I mentioned earlier, most financial advisors are highly reactive. Uh, websites are, are brochures for the most part, very nice looking brochures, and we're wasting leads. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Uh, most financial advisors don't know their website numbers and don't know your stats. You don't know how many people visited last week. And I, I, I say that in a broad brush approach. I'm saying the vast majority of financial advisors do. And many traditional methods of financial advisor marketing are running out of steam. And I'll explain that in a minute. Um, so this idea that someone will just arrive on your website and they'll think, um, yeah, I like the look of this person, we'll get in touch with them. That really is changing. This is known as the buy cycle. They used to be very direct. They would arrive on your website and they go, yeah, you're the one for me. They would be referred uh, to you and that was good enough and gets you uh, an inquiry. Today, um, really people need experience of you and your expertise in several different places before they start to make the decision. Um, and our websites are fundamentally designed as a sort of one step. Someone arrives, uh, we pitch our proposition and people go, yeah or no, they don't, as the case may be. Where really what we need to be doing is this concept of the value ladder. I know some of you heard me talk about this before, where we tease people into our world gradually and carefully. We've got some common expectations around leads. Um, we've got a website and I see this happen so often. Lots of financial advisors, they have a brand, they put up their website and they go tick, that's another job done. And they sit back and they go, great, I'm now in the world of e-commerce. No, you're not. Your website, just because you've got a website doesn't necessarily mean that someone is actually gonna to want to talk to you. We've got to make our websites work much harder and a scorecard will help you to do that. Uh, I've talked about referrals. We have this expectation that referrals will just come automatically. They do, but trust me, that model is beginning to creak a little bit, and we need to we need to firm it up. We need to shore it up. Um, some of, we 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 tend to pay lip service to uh, relationships with professional introducers. The top financial planners around the world really, really work hard on relationships with professional connections. We tend to have sort of much more relaxed relationships. Back in the 70s and 80s, 
we worked much harder at building relationships with local accountants, solicitors, state agents, bank managers, and people like that. We really worked those relationships. Today, it's much more relaxed. Uh, and so we could be doing much, much better. We want our lead providers to be quick and inexpensive. Well, if you want that, the quality of the leads will be through the floor. And I know many of you have seen that with some providers. We want and expect lead providers to be quick and high quality. Well, that doesn't happen. We expect lead providers to be giving us leads that are high quality and inexpensive. That's not gonna happen. Um, and really a lot of financial advisors feel and believe that operating in a niche market will actually reduce the number of leads they'll receive when in fact the opposite is the case. So I'm going to put a bit more meat on most of this as we go. When I say that traditional marketing is running out of, out of steam, this is what I mean. You know, right now we can't go to networking events. Um, those financial advisors that do go to networking events um, have very, very mixed experience of particularly BNI, um, I don't know why BNI seems to be the default networking uh, group to go to. There are so many others, Business Over Breakfast, NRG, uh, really, really good quality. Um, but it has been running out of steam. And while we're still in a pandemic, networking isn't really an option. Seminars, as I said, is the most powerful lead generation tool, but we can't do those right now. And I don't think for the foreseeable future, too many people will be too keen to go along to seminars. So they're running out of steam. Trade shows just don't exist. Um, and they used to be really, really powerful. Web listings, well, I'm sure all of you have experience of web listings um, and online directories uh, that just don't cut it anymore, to be quite honest. Social media is just noise um, and being heard amongst the noise uh, is really, really difficult with the exception of LinkedIn. LinkedIn is really powerful if you know how. And as I've mentioned, automatic referrals. So traditional marketing that financial advisors tend to do is creaking a little bit and we need to look at a few new ways of doing it. So let's just have a look and see how marketing has developed a little bit. If we go back to 1998, that sort of period, the dawn of digital, we were all really excited about it. Uh, I remember standing up in front of financial advisor audiences back then saying, look, there's some really exciting uh, shiny objects out there, which you ought to give it, give it, give a try to. And we were all sort of getting used to it. We didn't call it social media back then. We called it social networking. Um, and those people that really understood the difference between social networking and social media really, really benefited well. Clearly, it was an exciting opportunity because we could do our marketing online. We didn't have to get off our backsides and go and see someone, go and do something. And for the most part, digital was absolutely free. So what's not to like? We move forward a few years, the golden era of digital marketing for financial advisors. It was pretty easy to get followers. For some reason, uh, we sort of measured success in followers. Um, and the best way to get followers was just to follow other people. Um, we could post something and we'd get engagement for absolutely free. Pretty well everyone would see the content that we did post out there. Um, if you were using Facebook back in the day, or if you were using Twitter back in the day and LinkedIn, business was free. Everything was free. Um, if you were even vaguely consistent in the content that you posted online as well, you were pretty well classed as an influencer. And to be quite honest, all of this was a really good return on wasting a lot of time. And I'm sure most of you watching this right now know how much time is wasted on social media these days, particularly if you haven't got a plan. Bring it up to 2020, it's all starting to, to, to creak massively. Everyone's on social media now. The noise levels are ridiculous, uh, particularly on social media. It's really difficult to get attention unless you pay. And I haven't got a problem with paying to use social media as long as you get a good return on that. Our audiences are starting to tune out when it comes to digital marketing as well. And they filter what they can and what they want to see and what they don't want to see. The platforms are now monetizing. As I said, you know, if you go back five years ago, Facebook was just phenomenal for financial advisors. Unfortunately, five years ago, most financial advisors were not using Facebook in any way, shape or form. Um, and, and if you look at LinkedIn today, LinkedIn today is like Facebook was five years ago. You can get a lot of attention for free. Facebook wants you to pay. 
as I said, I've got a problem with paying for Facebook ads, but you have to get to a point where every one pound that you spend um, on Facebook advertising has got to bring in two to 10 pounds in return. Um, if for those of you that would that are interested in Facebook advertising, just drop me an email later and I will introduce you to someone who is a serious Facebook advertising expert and works with financial advisors as well. So if that's just something you're interested in, just uh, drop me a line. So today, digital um, is quite a poor return on wasting time. So we need focus. We need discipline and we need real strategy. So what sort of strategy could we come up with if we're using the internet? This idea that we can just mess around online in the hope that we're going to get some business is just nonsense. We need to get focus. We need to come up with a strategy. We need a plan. Fundamentally, that plan does not actually need to be too complicated. It can be as simple as getting a sheet of paper and going, right, who is my ideal dream client? and describe them in a great deal of detail. Marketers call this your ideal client avatar and then get some real folks. Where do they hang out? Where are they? And Jeremy Squibb on here from Serenity might conclude, well, actually they hang out on the Porth Levin Bowling Green. So instantly Jeremy's got a marketing plan. Okay, I'm gonna put all my effort into the Porth Levin area, that sort of thing. I mean, that's simplifying it quite a lot, but if you understand and know who are the dream clients that you really, really want, where do they hang out online? What newspapers do they read? Where do they go on holiday? What magazines do they read? What radio programs do they listen to? What podcasts? Really get some detail about these people. And then you can get some real focus and then you can come up with a plan. We need to focus less on driving traffic to our websites and focus more on converting those people who are already visiting your website into actual inquiries. We need to personalize our marketing. We ought to get closer to uh, joint venture partners, influencers, those sort of people. That's sort of more advanced strategy, but there's a lot of good work that's been done on that. We also, as part of our marketing strategy, really need to think about educational and uh, educational assets and adding real value to people in other words proving our expertise if you've written a book that suggests real expertise if you've got a long running podcast or a long running youtube channel that suggests real expertise if you've written some white papers or special reports quality stuff yeah the occasional blogs all right but quality in-depth content based around our expertise that is proof of expertise as well and we also need to be using marketing that creates real curiosity in what we're doing so lead gen 1.0 is about collecting name number and email lead gen 2.0 is about collecting meaningful data and leveraging it intelligently for the benefit of you and the prospect and to build better relationships much faster. And that's where scorecards come in. So a simple marketing strategy that you might want to think about is one like this that uses educational assets, that has a website that is a far more interactive than it is now, mm -hmm. that you give personalized uh, marketing and content to people and you think about the concept of the value ladder. What I mean by educational assets, books, videos, podcasts, webinars, and personalized assessments. That is a scorecard. Your website. For most financial advisors, the website doesn't have a, any strategy behind it. It's overcomplicated. It looks really nice, but it's overcomplicated. It is little more than a brochure. It doesn't collect data and it doesn't convert the visitors that you've already got. For most financial advisors, I know some of you have seen this slide. I use this slide a lot. You cannot be a lookalike. Although I've said you're probably not in competition with the financial planner down the road, you still look the same. How's the, how do people looking at your websites expect to be able to tell the difference between you if your websites all say the same? None of you are paid to look and behave like other financial advisors, yet that is exactly what you do. You have the same words on your websites as every other financial advisor. You have remarkably similar themes. I don't know what it is about hot air balloons, but a lot, a lot of financial advisor websites have got hot air balloons on them, lighthouses, 
the green shoots, people holding green shoots in their hands, elderly folks sitting on deck chairs on the seafront, couples with grandchildren sitting on their shoulders, flying kites. I mean, it's, it's all very nice. It all looks very nice, but it does not convert visitors into people that you can decide. And Financial Advisor websites really are very bland. They say the bleed and obvious. People are much, much better informed than they used to be. So a lot of financial advisors give sort of vague information, vague advice, vague directions. And this is stuff I've taken off financial advisors website. Our advisors will guide you to a comfortable future. I mean, what on earth does that mean? Our passion is helping our clients. Well, of course it is. We are highly qualified. I hope so. This is all platitude stuff that really does not help anyone. Um, so we've got to move, step, move, move things forward. Your website needs to speak to their specific issue. So, for example, if your target market is, I don't know, heart surgeons in West London, your website really needs to say, are you a heart surgeon in West London concerned about your income in retirement? If so, download our free guide for heart surgeons on how to, something like that. It really needs to speak to them. And you're the financial advisors. You know the problems and the issues faced by your clients. Your website needs to reflect that. One of the biggest mistakes financial advisors make on LinkedIn is that their LinkedIn profile looks like a CV. It doesn't speak to your dream clients. And that's why whenever LinkedIn comes up in our Facebook group, in the Life Talk Facebook group, whenever LinkedIn's mentioned, people come out, come out the woodwork saying, oh, I stopped using LinkedIn years ago. Oh, it's full of uh, recruiters. And I get that. And the reason why you get approached by recruiters is because your profile, it's your fault, basically. Your profile is designed to look like a generic profile for a financial advisor. If you turn your LinkedIn profile into something that is aimed directly at the specific issues, needs, worries, and concerns of your dream target client, then guess what happens? Recruiters aren't interested. Small point. Um, when someone visits your website, they need to feel that you're the only choice. They need proof of your expertise and they need a reason to engage with you. So far too often, we've been focusing on how do we get people to visit our website? That is actually not the issue or the problem. Most financial advisors' websites these days look really nice, as I've said. They've been built by high quality people who know what they're doing. They know how to search engine, make them good for the search engines. And most of you have got enough people visiting your website already. They are just not converting. And that's what a scorecard will do. And just briefly, I did some research into 100 financial advisors' websites uh, about a year and a half ago, and I found some really interesting stuff. Most, on average, most financial advisors were getting 197 visits to their website each month. Some much more, some much fewer. Um, now, even if you said that half of those people visiting your website were, I don't know, recruiters or people that were never going to get in touch with you anyway, you're still left with a pretty decent number, a pretty decent number, the overwhelming, overwhelming majority of whom did not get in touch with you. So that's the average number of visits to financial advisors websites that I discovered. So that's a pretty good number. That's pretty respectable for most financial advisors. But you really do need to know a bit more about what's going on in your website. Just the basic web stats, how many visits, how many pages were visited, which pages, how long did they spend, what did they search for on Google, where are they, and what was the page where they finally gave up and decided to leave. You also need to know the bounce rate, and the bounce rate is the percentage of people who arrive on your website and then leave without looking at any other page. Of the websites I looked at, the average bounce rate for those financial advisors was 54%. One of them was 87%. And that financial advisor is on this call today. 87% of the people who visited their website left without looking. 54% of visitors to your website left on average. A good bounce rate is about 23 to 25%. So you should expect about a quarter of your website visitors to actually leave straight away. 
So we need to get that bounce rate as low as we possibly can. The, the main reason people bounced off your website is because there's too much information on the homepage alone. On average, I counted 34 clickable links on those financial advisors' homepages. And when you think about, you know, your your navigation bar, you've got your about us, you've got your pensions page, you've got your investment page, you've got your click here for our social media, click for this, that, and that, 34 clickable links. And that basically creates confusion and a confused mind will always say no. What we have to do, and this goes back to actually to the early days of when financial advisors first started having websites. The, the sort of design um, model back in the early days when only about 10, 20% of financial advisors had websites. The design model back then was to cram as much stuff onto the homepage. The idea was to make the website sticky. It was called making your website sticky. Let's chuck as much stuff on the homepage um, in the hope that when people find our website, they'll stick around for ages. And unfortunately, most financial advisors' websites still do the same thing. They look so much better, but they still got way too much information uh, on the homepage. So we're doing all this marketing, we're doing all this lead generation, people are visiting your website, 197 a month on average, and we're being bombarded with calls to action. And that is just like hitting a brick wall. And as I said, a confused mind will always say no. And it is no better than going down to your local shopping mall and handing out leaflets in the hope that someone will go, oh, I've been looking for a financial advisor like you. It just doesn't happen. So we need to go up a gear. There is also science behind this as well. It's called Hicks Law. Uh, the, the more choices someone has, the slower their reaction time is as well. And it gets worse the older you get. So many financial advisors that I know, they're looking for clients in their kind of 60s and above. And, you know, you're in kind of dangerous territory there if your website has got too much information on there and you are actually reducing the likelihood even more that they'll want to get in touch with you. So in short, financial advisor websites are receiving visitors. The websites look really nice. They're very high quality brochures, but they're not engaging and they're not converting. We need to find a way to turn the majority of those people who visit your website into actual inquiries, but we don't want any old inquiry from the financial advisors I know, you don't want leads shoveled into your business. What you want is the quality. And if you're able to get a sense of someone's financial planning situation before you ever speak to them, then you can actually filter out the stuff that you really don't want. And it is the case that the views of your shop or your business from the outside are never as valuable as the view from the inside. We need people actually coming into your business and learning about you and showing real interest, real curiosity in doing that. And a scorecard will help you do that. So to conclude the bit on websites, websites should do one of two things, either add value to existing clients or convert new visitors. It's not a brochure. Really important we get that. Focus on converting new visitors, but we want the right visitors. And the way we're gonna do that is by providing serious value to them when they arrive on your website. We give them a personalized experience and a scorecard will give people, give different people a different experience of your website. Isn't that clever? And it gives you the opportunities to start conversations with people that lead to the right way. So let's look a little bit about personalization and why this is seriously important as well. It enables you to get data. When you personalize your messaging, you personalize your website to different people, they willingly give you data. It makes your website work harder and smarter. It gets you leads through education and value, and you're addressing visitors' actual concerns, challenges, and pain as well. And just a couple of examples of personalization uh, that I've come across. So when I was working with Zurich Life, I was head of national accounts, um, and that meant I had a hand in the marketing uh, budget. And so uh, advertising agencies used to approach me all the time to try and get some of our cash and this is one marketing piece that I was sent by uh, an advertising agency. And it kind of looks like a shaving mirror uh, that someone's written in in their finger. Phil Calvert, you change your toothbrush when it's worn out, so why not your agency? This was done, this was done by hand. 
um, before we had fancy uh, digital tools to do this. Someone actually created this by hand. Uh, here's another one. The same agency sent me this. Do you think this got my attention? Of course it got my attention. Um, uh, I've even got it framed here in my office. Uh, and so this, this was done by hand and uh, that's personalization. That's how it works. Uh, another example, I was looking to sell my uh, house a few years ago as well. And I went around all the local estate agents and again, they all said the same thing, literally verbatim. They said the same thing. I went to each one. They all promised me a great service. They all said they'd do me a, an offer on the fees. They all made great promises. And I actually ended up, I went home at the end of the day more confused than anything else. I just didn't know which one to go for. So I thought, well, I'll sleep on this. The following day in the post, I open an envelope and inside the envelope is a piece of red carpet about eight inches by uh, six inches. I thought, okay, that's different. Um, and I turned it over and on the other side of the red carpet, it said this, Philip handwritten, all our clients get the same treatment, the red carpet treatment. They got my business, super easy, super simple, properly old school. Uh, and I give you that as a freebie today. Um, now that we can come out of lockdown, get down to your local carpet center, buy up a few yards of red carpet, cut up into little squares and send that to every new inquiry that you ever get. Super simple, nicely personalized. It gets people's attention. But really good marketing like this gets people onto your value ladder. The process of building a relationship with people to make it easier to have conversations um, and to actually increase the likelihood of getting more and better referrals. The value ladder for a dentist might look something like this these days. My dad was a dentist, retired long before uh, the internet. All dentists' websites say the same thing. So they have to be creative. So what a lot of dentists will now do is offer freebies just to get you in the building. A lot of them will do free teeth cleaning or even free teeth whitening. You know, free teeth whitening, that's quite expensive for that to do, but it's to get you in the building. They look after you, they treat you really well. They get a video testimonial of why you're there. They put it on their YouTube channel. They put it on, your, on their website. But you go in, you have a great experience and you think, yeah, okay, uh, I'll stick with this dentist. What the dentists really want is this business here, the cosmetic surgery business. That's the high value, the big ticket stuff. That's what they really want. Um, but they need to do other stuff to get it, make it much more likely that you'll pay the top end stuff. A chiropractor, free consultation, free massage. What they really want is to get you to pay big bucks to go on their, their weekend wellness retreat. Yeah. Value ladder for a gym. Most value ladders for gym starts on January the 1st. But again, they want to give you a freebie, get you in give you a great experience, treat you really well, so that it becomes much more likely that you'll go on to have personal coaching and so on and so forth. This is my value ladder for financial advisors. In an ideal world, I would like you to pay a lot of money to come on my deep dive weekend marketing retreat, where we get in guest speakers, we go and stay in a really nice hotel, we have a top chef. That's what I'd really like you to do, but that's really expensive. And if my website only said uh, weekend marketing retreats for financial advisors, come join us, no one's going to take it up because financial advisors go, well, hold on, who is this Phil Carver guy? I don't know who he is. So I'm not going to buy that. So what I do is I throw a uh, bait out into the world through the Facebook group, the marketing group. And for those of you that are in our Facebook group, I mean, there's serious value that you get in that group for free. There's nothing about that you couldn't learn or share about how to run a successful financial advice business in that free Facebook group. Uh, I've got my scorecards. I've got a variety of different scorecards that I use. I give away free books and it gradually goes up invaluable. So the things in green are free. The things in blue are either free or chargeable. The things in black I always charge for and things in red are reassuringly expensive. But I have to gradually bring people into my world to make it more likely that they're going to go higher up the ladder. So for a financial advisor, you could do any of these things as part of your value ladder. I mean, this is just like, this is almost everything you could do. Give away a free guide, a tips book, a scorecard, 
um, an ebook. Gradually bring people into your world uh, so that it becomes much more likely. And those of you that do put on seminars, you will know just how powerful seminars are in terms of bringing people into your world. Um, yet when you think about it, most financial advisors websites only promote one thing, financial planning. We're expecting people who have never heard of us to arrive on our website and to jump straight up to a really high value service without having experienced any other aspects of your expertise along the way. That's quite a big ask in today's world. So it, to make it easier for people, let's tease them in and bring it. Now, that's a lot of different options. What you could do is just simplify it to, to something like this. Start with a scorecard. Maybe give everybody who goes through your scorecard a freebie, an e-guide. Uh, Mike Legasic, who we're going to talk to in a minute, you, he does that as well. Maybe do a podcast. Podcasts are high value. A seminar or webinar. And yes, a weekend retreat. Your proposition does not have to end at financial planning. Mm. There are a lot of financial planners around the world now who take it a stage further. And they do weekend retreats, a deep dive into the world of personal finance uh, in a, a high-end hotel with uh, expert speakers coming in, uh, nice food, bit of yoga maybe. Um, I know one financial advisor in the United States who does a, a quarterly weekend wealth symposium. He charges 10,000 pounds a ticket and he's got people queuing up for this a year in, a, a, a year in advance. So the expertise you have as financial advisors does not have to be just given one-to-one -one on Zoom with clients or face-to-face -face in uh, your office. You can take it to a whole another level as well. That's a value ladder, and I see that happening much more with financial advisors. Uh, examples of value ladder, Martin Bamford, classic example of that. He's written at least three books, and he still has clients come to him today. So, oh, Martin, I read your book a little while back. Um, and so on and so forth. So that's part of his value ladder. Catherine Morgan, uh, some of you know Catherine, a rising star in the world of financial planning, financial coaching as well. She's got her podcast. She does online challenges, a free challenge, a proven five-day challenge to help you identify what kind of relationship you have with money, unlock self-limiting beliefs that are holding you back. These are lead magnets by any other name but they are serious pieces of value that bring people into Catherine's world. And once they've experienced her on her online uh, content or through her podcast, there's no way someone's gonna go to another financial planner. Uh, the daddy, Pete Matthew, of course, um, who's been doing this for a long, long time now. Uh, I mentioned Jeremy again earlier. Jeremy's uh, got his Escaping the Bucket podcast, uh, which is a brilliant theme around crabs trying to escape a bucket. Uh, really like that as well. These things take real commitment. There's no question about that as well. You can't do a couple of podcasts and, and sit back and hope it comes in. You know, Pete is now getting millions of downloads, literally. And he's, he also tells you that although he gets thousands and thousands and thousands of people listen to his podcast, he says his actual ideal dream clients present themselves. He doesn't get people um, phoning him up saying, Pete, I heard your um, podcast on millennial finances the other day. Uh, could you just tell me if I'm being ripped off on my credit card charges? He doesn't get that sort of stuff. Martin Lewis gets that kind of stuff, yeah? Pete says the quality of the clients that he gets uh, through sharing educational value is really quite phenomenal. Um, okay. So let's go back to 1987, 88. Kylie was riding high in the charts. Bruce Willis, <laughs> that film was just phenomenal. And I was a broker consultant and um, part of my patch was Southwest London, Hampshire. Um, and I met a financial advisor who was based out of Kingston or Surbiton, somewhere right there, I can't quite remember. His name was Mick. Uh, he was one of the financial advisors on my patch. He was incredibly successful. He was a one-man band, and his wife did um, a couple of days a week or, and helped out from time to time. He was so successful. He lived in St. George's Hill in Weybridge, which is where the very rich and famous live. His next-door neighbor was Cliff Richard. Literally, his next-door neighbor was Cliff Richard. 
Mick's primary marketing tool was seminars and worksite presentations. Um, and had a thing called the Mix One Minute Money Quiz that he did during these presentations. Now, um, he, uh, being in Surbiton or Kingston, that part of the world, uh, he was on the A3, which runs from London down to, uh, what, Portsmouth. Um, and there are lots of towns off the A3. And he used to, he got a reputation for working with uh, print shop owners. Um, print shop, people own printing companies, and this was pre-digital printing. Uh, he would do their just their normal personal finances, mortgages, pensions, PHI, that, that kind of stuff as well. And, that, you know, print owners, they all networked with each other. They all recommended him. So he would do, go and do their, their personal finances. But one thing he would always do is when he was working with him and, and the, the other directors in the business, he would say, look, would it be possible if I could do a presentation to your, your team, your staff, your colleagues? Uh, at a tea break or a lunch break or something like that and they would always say yeah no problem at all absolutely fine and we used to call this worksite marketing back in the day some of you might have actually done it now Mick would do his generic presentation on personal finance but he would have a handout and it was a six by four inch postcard and it looked something like this he would give everyone in the audience this postcard and it had five questions on it um, I have got the postcard somewhere I've got the postcard but these are the questions that he asked on the postcard do you save regularly how often do you worry about money are you likely to receive an inheritance who's the made breadwinner and how much would your family have if you or your spouse died today and he would ask people he said look could you just answer those questions put your name on it and your phone number and I will collect them in at the end of the presentation and what he would do is he'd say, look, I'll pick one at random before I leave. And he would give them like a book token uh, or a bottle of wine or something like that. OK, and everybody would fill in one of these. And some days he went home with five postcards. Sometimes he'd go home with 500 postcards. And whether he was working with print shop owners or any other business with lots of employees, this is his marketing tool. And what he would do, he would collect the cards in he would take them home and he would sit down with his wife and he would then send a letter to every single person who filled in a postcard. Every single one of them would get a letter that looked personalized. It was personalized. There was a bit of sort of ready-made paragraphs that, that he would use, but you as financial advisors watching this presentation right now, you know that the answers to those five questions there will give you well, probably more information than you get with the current leads that you already receive, but you will be able to tell something about that person who'd filled in that postcard simply by the answers to those questions. So what he would do, he would send a letter and he'd go, uh, 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 hi, Mrs. Jones or Mr. Jones, thanks for filling in the postcard. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation the other day. I hope you got some value out of it. Um, I can see that clearly you're on top of your savings. It's something, something you're obviously disciplined about which is really good news for your future. But I noticed uh, from the answer to one of the other questions that you might have a bit of a problem if you or your husband uh, or your wife were to die tonight. That's something that we can help you with. Would you be interested in having a meeting? And what he found was nine times out of 10, people would respond positively to that personalized letter because he had given them some value based on their personal situation. That is why this one postcard is why Mick was so successful and was able to live next door to Cliff Richard. Now you may not want to live next door to Cliff Richard, but it's a mark of just how successful he was um, at the time. This doesn't get more simple in terms of a, as a marketing tool, but this guys and girls, is a scorecard by any other name. That is a scorecard. You ask questions about their personal situation. You reply with, in a, with a personalized answer and it makes it significantly more likely that they will want to become a client. Now, Mick would also know when he went through all the postcards, although he would reply to everybody, he knew perfectly well that some of the people who answered the postcard said, no, I don't want them as clients. He could literally pick and choose who he wanted to follow up but everybody who filled in a postcard 
ended up on his newsletter list, literally everybody. Everybody who filled in a postcard ended up on his seminar list as well. So this gave him the ability to collect data, to give a personalized response, but to also pick and choose the clients that he want, wanted to work with. So that was being done in 1987, 1988. It worked then, it'll work now. So scorecard marketing is perfect for any business that needs to get data to know and understand each prospect as an individual before they can become a client. This is data-driven marketing. Data-driven marketing is a method of marketing that uses data gathered from customer interactions to better understand their motivations, preferences, and behaviors. Businesses that use data-driven marketing invariably enhance the customer experience and it leads to greater revenue and profit and value for the clients. In other words, everybody wins. But the beauty of this thing is that it creates real curiosity in you. And also when somebody first lands on your scorecard, there is inbuilt curiosity straight away. And it, it is as simple as the fact that everyone loves a quiz. A scorecard is a quiz. It's a survey. It's an online assessment. And people actually find it really difficult to resist taking a quiz or an assessment, which gives them unique, unique insights into themselves. And we've all done it, haven't we? We've all found websites where there's some uh, quick survey where we'll get a result in about a minute's time or five minutes time. And this is based around the simple premise that human beings love to benchmark themselves. They can get an instant assessment, an instant result. They can compare themselves against other people or against some sort of standard. Uh, it will show them areas of weakness. Um, it will give them immediate access to an expert with personalized help and you can get a personalized plan. And the point about this is that based on your, their answers, people tend to want to aspire to do better. People want to improve the score that they've already got. And as I said, we've all filled these things in. We've seen them all the time. Online assessment tools. How fit am I? How intelligent am I? How does my love life compare with others? Is my business idea that I've got ready to pitch? Am I a natural leader? How ready am I for retirement? Okay online assessment tools, really powerful. So a scorecard is simply, essentially, it's a simple, attractive website survey page with a series of yes, no, or multiple choice questions. People go through the questions and there's usually between 20 and 40 questions. It gives them an instant score and a personalized report. That report does not give financial advice. It then gives them an opportunity um, for them to talk to you, and it's all done in a GDPR compliant manner. So looking at the same thing in a bit more detail, it really looks very nice. We'll show you a couple in a minute. Um, it's custom branded to you. It gives a sort of traffic like scoring and the report and the assessment is dynamically created. So depending on the score they get, they get some text that is based on the score. So they get a certain text if they get a really high score, they get a different text if they get a medium score, and they get a different text if they get a low score. Um, this is the value they get then creates uh, curiosity in your services. So essentially what they are doing is completing a fact find that is disguised as a quiz. That gives you data, so you can then understand each prospect as an individual and you can literally pick and choose who you want to follow up. Now, when you think about leads that you currently get at the moment as financial advisors, they come from all over the place, don't they? By having a scorecard, you can direct all those leads onto your scorecard. So let's imagine for a moment that you get leads from a local accountant or a solicitor. I don't know how they do, whether they send you an email or whether they pick the phone up. What you can do is you can go to your accountant connection or your sister connection and say, look, we've got this fantastic tool. If you've got any more inquiries for us, please send them to this particular link and you give them the link to your scorecard. So make it a central destination for every single lead or inquiry that you, that you get. So it gets them all on the same page. They all get the same experience of you and your value. Um, and it makes them much, much more likely to respond to you positively. So what this does for you, it improves the effectiveness of your marketing by putting value at its heart. 
it turns your web presence into something of real value and not just a brochure. It creates real curiosity in what you do because they've got to they've already experienced an aspect of your service. It encourages visitors to your website to genuinely engage with you. It gives you real, highly qualified, data-rich leads, and then you're able to personalize your contact by understanding each individual prospect. Now, to me, this is an absolute game changer. And I keep thinking back to Mix postcard. This guy was doing that years and years ago. And really all we're doing is taking that model and putting it into the digital world as well. So your scorecard becomes an integral part, if not the first step of your value ladder. It turns your website into something that actually works. You get high quality leads and you can personalize your approach and it positions you as an expert. So the quality of the conversations you're going to be able to have now, now that you've access to instant data rich is literally game changing. So at this point, I'd just like to introduce um, Mike, because um, you and I, Mike, we first started talking uh, about this. And I talked about what I've been talking about today in terms of this as a lead gen tool. But what you experienced was something a little bit different. Do you just want us to talk about what your experience and what your scorecard has, has done for you? And I'll show people your scorecard homepage in just in just a minute. Uh, yeah, thanks, Phil. You can hear me okay, yeah? Yeah, I can, yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I, I first looked, I first started looking at scorecards about 18 months ago. Um, but it was a bit like Eric Morecambe. I was sort of playing all the right notes, but not necessarily in the right order. <laughs> I had an idea of what I wanted it to do, but what I didn't understand or what I really struggled with was the end output, how their scorecards, uh, how they work and how you score the answers. And I've got a few um, things I just wanted to touch on here, I'll, I'll mention. Um, Phil worked and helped develop mine uh, about four or five weeks ago. And it produced some um, information that I really wasn't quite expecting. It had, a, it had a unusual si um, side effect, if you like. I built it on my website to obviously engage new clients and to find out information, but I also used it as a tool to help my existing clients and check their understanding of what I explained to them. So like, mo like pretty much everyone on here, I guess everyone wants to manage people's expectations and explain things in layman's terms. But the way I put my scorecard together was I asked some sort of behavioral questions and some views on uh, investing and the answers they gave me um, immediately highlighted that they didn't still quite understand how investing certain aspects of it really works. So it's highlighted areas where I need to speak to that client and re-educate the, the issues that they've raised, which clearly tells me that they have misunderstood some things. Um, and like everyone on here, I guess we think you all do a great, great job explaining this type of concept that we do. But some of the answers immediately highlighted I needed to pick the phone up or arrange a review meeting sooner rather than later. A few things I would just say from an insight point of view is um, you're never going to get it 100% right. Um, what's the what, right amount of questions? Too short, you don't get a full picture. Too many and people are going to switch off. Um, it's trying to find the sweet spot. And the other thing I did struggle with, but we got there in the end, was I didn't want to deflate anybody. So I didn't want someone who scored what would be deemed as low to be demoralizingly low. Yeah. I, I had to try and find the sweet spot on a good score represented a really good score and congratulations. Medium was yet yeah, okay, but I didn't want the point scoring to be where someone would look at it and think, oh my God, what am I doing? I'm clueless or embarrassing. So these are the sweet spots that Phil helped me sort of find the right area. And you can go into the back office and tweak the point scoring mechanism. So yeah, just to clarify that. so. When you ask a question to someone, if you ask the question maybe, um, are you a regular saver? The right answer is obviously yes. The wrong answer is no. So you reward people who say yes, they get more points than someone who gets no. But as Mike said, you never want to give someone a zero score because they could go through the scorecard and at the end they might throw their arms up in horror and say, there's no hope what's the point of me talking to the financial advisor? So you actually want to give them some sort of score so they feel, okay, maybe with Mike's help, we can make some progress. Yeah, exactly that. And that was one of the most difficult things to do. I mean, and feedback from clients has been really interesting as well. Um, 
I have the, the feedback. I, I, I first dry tested it with friends and family. And I said, look, if you don't give me a brutal, honest appraisal, then this is a waste of time. If you think it's a mile away from how you perceive yourself, then please let me know because I need to review it. Um, and I can only speak as I find. And the uh, I did send out about 30 of these things privately to people I know. And the feedback was that, you know, I would have to say a good 90% did honestly say to me, Mike, that is me, bang on. That That's me. That's how I perceive myself. I didn't get anyone who come back and said, that's a mile away. What are you doing? Um, and and, and they, were all, you know, they, they were honest people. You know, I laid it on with a trial that I needed genuine feedback because they wouldn't be helping me otherwise. And you will find that it's probably going to be a transitional thing. You're going to, it's a moving feature, you're probably going to tweak it. I mean, I'm going to go back and reduce some of mine on some of the um, information that clients have sent back to me on some of the questions. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's really interesting the way you have looked at it. You said, well, actually, I feel that I ought to be putting my existing clients through this um, just as much as somebody who new comes new comes comes to. And something else I think you mentioned is, you know, you could you could make this an annual activity as well uh, as part of your proposition. Just remind people it's time to take the scorecard and use the advisor can get a sense of how people's thinking has changed over time. Um, and it, it gives you some quite extraordinary insights into the way people are thinking, doesn't it? It, it really does. Yeah, absolutely. You I said mean, you said to me at one point you thought people thought you were a mind reader that you knew so much about them. Well, it, it is a bit like that. I mean, it, it's a bit like um, <laughs> it is because although you've spoke to these clients many times before and you think you understand them to a high degree, um, I guess there's always going to be issues where clients get the wrong end of the stick, or they just simply forget, or they read something that changes their viewpoint, and it's good to readdress it and to make sure. It's like my newsletters, I call them regular shots of sanity serum to keep their head on straight, particularly yeah. in the last 12 months. Yeah. But um, yeah, some of the answers, I mean, I'll, I'll just give you an example. I mean, um, one of the questions I've got, because I've, stu because I've studied behavioral economics and decision-making and biases for the last sort of five or six years, um, don't worry, I've got a life, by the way, I'm not a transport. <laughs> but, but basically, uh, uh, getting the insights in how clients think has been a big um, boon to my business. And, and one of the questions I've got there is, which of the following are you most drawn to investing over the next 10 years or the long term? And I've got gold, you know, gold, silver, uh, gold, property, the stock market. Now, if someone is about to give you a large investment and yet they think that property is going to be the best thing, then there's obviously um, a conflict there. And one of the other questions I've got is, which investment option do you think will grow the most? Stoke has the best chance of maintaining its purchasing power, keeping up with inflation. And again, I've got property, gold, the stock market, and some people have put property down. Now, that immediately tells me there's a conflict there. They're about to entrust a half a million quid or whatever it is to put into the stock market, yet they're telling me that they believe that property is going to be the best performing asset. Yeah. Yeah. That's immediately give me a discussion point to find out why they've answered that question the way they have and whether any biases or misinformation and misconceptions is getting in the way. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. So the score is a value, the score that people get once they've been through it is of value and interest to the person going through it. But in many ways to the financial advisor, the score is irrelevant. What is much more important is the answers to the questions that they gave. Because you can, oh. you've even got this instant talking point that you can pick up with people. Yeah, I mean, if it was a brand new client, then you could sort of forgive them, you know, for, you know, I mean, it's their opinion. I mean, who's to say what asset's going to be better? But yeah. if they're looking at historical returns or they think gold's going to be the best thing since sliced bread and that's where they should put their investment money, yeah. then clearly there's something that needs to be discussed there. Yeah. Yeah. One other interesting thing I would add is that um, because it's on social media, a lot of people have shared it. Have so they? it's produced, it, it's got the, it's got it out there a bit more. So they've perhaps shared it on a Facebook link or said, I found it interesting or shared yeah. it to a friend. So it does, it does, once yeah. it's out there. It, it you see that being done on Facebook all the time. Any of these self-assessment tools, people, do, humans just love them uh, and they share them all over the place. Um, so the point is, uh, uh, Mike was saying, yes, there are talking points that you can pick up with people, but Mike doesn't have to follow up with anybody he doesn't want to. He can look through the answers and said, no, this one, no hope, really not interested in this particular one, uh, I'll pass. However, what he can do is still add them to his um, newsletter list. And the, the way the GDPR is done, the opt-in is done, is that people are actually opting in 
to get A, their results, and B, um, email newsletter communications as well. So you can set the GDPR up any, any way you particularly want to. Yeah, just and the other thing I would just say is that it goes into the client folder because it's another sort of an addition to compliance, know your client. Yeah. So because, because the way they've answered those questions, you know, the FCA are going to have a bit more of a difficult time saying, how much do you know about your client? So in addition to your attitude to risk questionnaires, I mean, it depends what you're trying to get out of a scorecard. Yours might be completely different to mine and no doubt it will be. But from that point of view, as far as I'm concerned, then I drop it into the client folder and it's another layer of, you know, I have found out quite a bit about my, the way my client thinks. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And just briefly to show uh, Mike's homepage. Um, so it, Mike's is a little bit different from other people. We'll show you some other themes in just a moment. Uh, so you're fundamentally going at learn how human behavior can impact your investment returns. Um, nice heading, and this is designed to um, look exactly like Mike's website. Um, we use the same imagery. So this is a bespoke one built to Mike's spec, uses the same colors as Mike's website as well. Uh, and people can dive in straight away if they want to. Uh, name, email, optional telephone, and here's the uh, GDPR opt-in, link to his privacy policy way, and bang, it goes straight into uh, the questions. But so people are going to want to look in. So Mike's got categories of questions built into his scorecard around attitude money, decision making, uh, their future vision, investing and planning. Um, a little bit more, they can dive in there. A bit of process, answer the questions, simple yes, no or multiple. So, so people are told in advance what's going to happen. They receive their report. They'll get it in 10 minutes. Most people are through before, in under 10 minutes, aren't they? On yours, Mike. Mm -hmm. Um, and take action, consider your next steps, and a bit more. And is regulatory stuff um, at the bottom as well. So it's a simple landing page. It is a website in its own right, uh, which can be linked to from your website. You can put a button on your main website that says here, take our uh, saver behavior. And I think that's what that's what Mike, Mike has done as well. But we'll show you a couple of other examples um, in just a moment. So if we go back to uh, presentation, go. Uh, so hopefully you can see the slide again. Yeah, quick thumbs up. You can see the slide. Great. Okay. So thanks a lot, Mike. That's, that's great. Um, so how it works, you come up with a theme in Mike's case, it's behavioral, uh, people's attitude and behaviors around money, you come up with your question categories, three to five categories is usually about right. Uh, you come up with your questions um, and for the bespoke build, I've got kind of like a ready-made bank of 150 different questions that you can pick and choose from. So you only want 20 to 40 questions, uh, questions and you can chop and change them, add in your own, whatever you want to do. It then gives people an overall score. They get category scores as well. And it gives people a report on, on, the, on the results page. That report is not financial advice. It's just observations based on their answers to the question. There's obviously a call to action. Um, and uh, if you want to try and encourage people to do something, but then you can follow them up after that. Um, you want to put uh, the scorecard headline on your homepage. You really want to make this something that people uh, want to do. It's a real carrot there, yeah? So your scorecard needs to focus on the desired benefit or outcome. In Mike's case, it's learn how your own behaviors can impact your investment returns. Um, and a, a good way to do it is actually come up with, are you ready to start your own business? Are you ready to run a marathon? Are you ready to retire? Are you ready to take out an equity release mortgage? Are you ready to unlock a better retirement? That kind of stuff, yeah? Um, in an ideal world as well, there's a lot of evidence that's come up, particularly during lockdown, that including your face on your landing page uh, is quite important as well, because it adds a bit more of a human touch to it. Uh, your face is, is uh, quite powerful in terms of marketing. Um, you need to have a strong theme. Um, and that strong value perception through self-diagnosis, base it on what your ideal client wishes for or desires. So if, you're, uh, if your clients, your ideal clients are heart surgeons nearing retirement, then your uh, scorecard theme should be based around surgeons ready for retirement. Are you a surgeon ready for retirement? 
Are you a surgeon and is your financial planning in place uh, to uh, give you a good income in retirement? But really what we're looking to help them is to avoid pain or problems. So again, are you ready to run a marathon? That could be the big headline right across the top. Are you ready to start the business? In, for financial advisors, are you ready to retire comfortably? How good is your legacy planning? Something like that. Think about your ideal top, your ideal market. What are the problems they're concerned about? What are their worries? And go for there. Uh, other examples of scorecards outside our industry. I've seen one called the Entrepreneur Identifier. Uh, which leading entrepreneur you are most similar to in business? Find out now. Are you one of the many UK companies who pay more tax than you need to? Take our scorecard and find out. Do you know your next six moves to ensure your business grows over the coming 12 months? If not, our scorecard will tell you. Does your target market like and trust your business? Find out in two minutes. We've seen these stuff all the time. We've probably done one or two of them ourselves as well. Um, you don't have to call it a scorecard. You can call it an analysis, a calculator. And here are just some of the names and themes that, that financial advisors are using um, or could use as the case may, may be. Money instincts, investment sophistication identifier. That's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, what retirement mindset assessment, attitude to wealth, financial fitness. There's a whole range of, of different ways, but really be guided by your target market. Now, I do a lot of LinkedIn consultancy. So one of the ways, well, the main way that I get LinkedIn consultancy work from financial advisors is I have a LinkedIn health check for financial advisors. Most financial advisors are on LinkedIn. And when they find me on LinkedIn, I have a set of messages that I send to them. And for every 10 financial advisors that um, I message or engage with on, on LinkedIn, 90% of them go through my scorecard. Uh, so financial advisors, uh, discover your LinkedIn strengths and weaknesses with our free LinkedIn health check. Take the LinkedIn test now. It's free, quick and easy. Yeah. Um, and I give them some incentives. I say, look, uh, at the end of the health check, you can get a free copy of my book or a guide or some sort of download. You can do the same. Mike has got a book uh, that on his results page that people can download uh, a copy of his book as well. You could offer a one-to-one -one consultation. You could offer a template, a special, you, you know, we're only limited by our imaginations as to what we could give people for saying thank you. And I know some financial, well, not, not financial advisors, but I know some people who give away uh, a 10 pound Amazon voucher. Now you compare giving away 10 pounds, the cost of buying a lead or a Facebook ad or a link 10 quid to drop in the ocean. So think about offering something uh, to say thank you to people for going through your scorecard. So in my LinkedIn health check, the categories I've got are, strat uh, so I've got questions around your LinkedIn strategy. I've got questions around how you set up your profile, questions around how you engage and network with other people, questions about the content you post on LinkedIn, uh, your company and uh, other LinkedIn features. And people are scored for their answers to those particular questions. So here are the sort of questions that I might ask, or that I do ask. Have you got LinkedIn strategy? It's yes or no. Have you got a personalized LinkedIn URL? It's yes or no. Have you completed the skill section? Do you do this, do that, do that and the other? Uh, it's simple, yes, no questions. We don't want people to have to think too hard about it. We want people to whiz through the scorecard. We don't want them to have to stop and look up an answer. Um, because that means they stop and they may not come back. So we want to make it nice and simple, simple yes, no questions or multiple choice, or there's even a sliding scale uh, thing that you can do as well. So those are the sort of questions that I do. So if someone says, yes, they have a LinkedIn strategy, I'm going to give them more points for a yes answer. The more yes answers you give, the more points you're going to get and the higher score you're going to get at the end of your scorecard. And this is how the questions actually look on the page. You can change the colors, uh, nice and simple, um, nothing too difficult there. Bad questions are questions that are too long or too complicated or they need time to think about. We really need people. You also don't want to ask questions that are a bit too intrusive and look a bit salesy. Do you need an IFA? That's a no-no. How much money have you got invested? Don't ask that question because the person on the other side would go, oh, I know what you're after here. Um, so we're looking at questions that, that are 
um, just helping to give you insights into people who are doing it. Uh, Mike says, if people are constantly taking too long to answer a particular question, tells you it needs to be amended. And so what the scorecard software does, it shows you how long on average people are taking to answer each question. And if you can see that some people are taking longer than others, that's a question that you need to reword. So keep it nice and simple as you go. Those of you that have got a niche market like heart surgeons or something like that, these things are really powerful because then you can make the branding even more, uh, even more effective. Um, of course, you can have, have niche. Lots of people think, well, no, I don't just deal with policemen or I don't just deal with surgeons. You can niche into several different markets as well. Um, so just think about to Jeremy down there in Cornwall. You know, you could create a scorecard for people in nearing retirement who own businesses in Cornwall um, and give it a nice Cornwall vibe um, and really, really make it focused. So the, the more focused you can make this, uh, the better. Then they get the results page, um, which gives them their results, gives them their score, and then it gives them a dynamic report uh, with answers based on that. If you can get your face, you can put video on the page as well. You can put in a, a call to action. You want to put some, maybe some testimonials on your results page as well. Um, your bonuses, your incentives, all that kind of stuff. So they get their score. This is what they came in for. But when they scroll down, they can naturally um, show a bit more interest in you. In practice, when people reach the results page, unless they've been absolutely blown away by what they've just experienced, they're not gonna phone you up straight away. What I've noticed and the software behind this tells you that they quite regularly come back to revisit their, their results page. And you can see that in the stats that the software gives you. Um, so it doesn't matter if they don't get in touch with you straight away. What does matter is that the moment someone reaches this page, you, the financial advisor, get a little email that arrives in your inbox that says, John Smith has just taken your retirement readiness uh, health check. Uh, take a look at their results. And you can go straight into the software. Uh, you can see their results. You can see their contact details. And you can see the answers they gave to the question. And at that point, you can then decide, oh, maybe this isn't a client for me. Um, but what you can do, if you think, oh, this is a client for me, you can pick up on one of the questions that they answered and phone them up, send them an email, it's entirely up to you. You can also hook this up to your CRM system um, as well, so you can have automated emails go out. Um, when someone hits the results page, an automated email goes out straight away anyway, and you can customize that email to however you want to do it. Um, so you get, in my case, here's, I can see the, the results that this particular person got in their different categories. Uh, I can get a whole bunch of different data, um, which is really, really valuable. So I can go and speak to them in a highly personalized way, in a highly informed way as well. But really important, you can decide, do I actually want this inquiry? And that saves you the time and the effort of having to get in touch with, with, with a lead. Wherever your leads come from right now, I know that most of the time you have to go and get information. Uh, and this saves you that one as well. So you can go back to them and say, hi, Mrs. Jones, I see that you're really, in, I've looked at your scorecard results. Uh, you've done pretty well. Um, and I can see you're, you're pretty good when it comes to saving, um, but there's, I notice there's a bit of gap in the protection, just like mix postcard, yeah? Is that something you'd like to work on? How you follow up the lead is entirely up to you but at least you've got information. And as Mike said to me the other day, they can't believe you know them so well. Um, so what you've got here is your own market research engine. And that really, really puts power in your hands because when people start going through your scorecard, uh, whether it's your existing clients or whether it's completely new prospects, you're in a position to, to, to segment people um, into different groups and follow them up in different ways or offer them different services. It's entirely up to you and your proposition. What you'll also find is that the data that comes through in your scorecard is just amazing for internal training with your team. It's also great for recruitment as well. You could actually create a scorecard for recruiting staff as well. 
um, almost like a little quiz for, for people. Are you uh, ready to work for Jones and Co Financial Planning? Uh, take, take our scorecard. But the data that is sitting in the back end there is just superb for training your colleagues, training staff and training you because you can show them, look, these are the sort of people that we take on as clients. These are the sort of people, and this is how they answer given questions. So absolutely brilliant for training. It is also superb for giving you content for content, whatever it is that you happen to be focusing on. So if you send out a regular newsletter, first of all, you wanna make absolutely sure that a link to your scorecard is in every single newsletter that you ever send out from now on make it a permanent feature. However, the content that you include in your newsletter could be guided by the data that you're picking up uh, through the results. And you will, as Mike has already discovered, you start seeing patterns, you start seeing things that you didn't know about your existing clients, and that gives you great information for a variety of different communication activities that, that you put out there. So for example, Jeremy down there in Cornwall, you could you will start to notice things about the people who go through your scorecard and you could create a press release that goes out. It says, according to um, the Serenity Financial Planning scorecard, 85% of people in, in Cornwall who've taken our scorecard uh, are worried about their level of income in retirement. 85% of people are worried that if they live to 100 years old, uh, they won't have enough money. So you can use the data that's coming through to uh, use in other communications. It's also brilliant to enhance relationships with professional connections as well. You could even collaborate with local accountants or solicitors and work on a joint scorecard in some way, shape or form. Um, it's also brilliant if you are looking for referrals. Most of your clients will find this a very valuable experience to go through and they will willingly pass it on and share it to other people. So at the bottom of the results page, there is a button where they can actually share a link to the scorecard as well, which is brilliant. Now, somebody else pointed out to me that if you are thinking about growing your business and thinking about selling it in a few years time, if you've got a tool like this, that assesses the value of each prospect and the value of existing clients as well. There is no question at all that a potential purchaser, you, well, you'll be in a position to put an extra premium on the value of your business. That You've got a lead gen, a built-in lead gen tool and also a built-in data gathering tool as well. Uh, that will definitely differentiate you from other financial advisors out there. Um, again, this is where I'm saying this isn't just a marketing tool. You can do all sorts of different things. As I mentioned, performance tracking. Put every client through this every single year and see how their answers change. Um, you don't have to do this. You could have somebody in your business can do this, uh, work with your colleague could do this. Um, use it to build your mailing list. Use it for your onboarding process. Every single new client that comes in, put them through this as well. It's not like it's arduous, it's a bit of fun for them. And as I said, it's based on the idea that human beings love self-assessment tools. They love to benchmark themselves um, against a standard that other people have set. So what you've got here is not just a marketing tool, but essentially you've got a, a valuable business asset. And as such, you really wanna promote it. I, I say to financial advisors, don't look at your LinkedIn profile as just another social media tool. Look at it as an asset of your business, particularly if it's structured and built well. So put a button on your website. Put it as a permanent link in your email signature. Put it in your out of office email. Mention it in your answer phone message. Put, there are multiple places on your LinkedIn profile that you can, that you can put it. Everyone you ever engage with um, on LinkedIn, even if it's recruiters, why don't you, you could create a scorecard, a, a financial planning scorecard for recruiters. Okay, how ready for you, how ready for retirement are you as a, as a recruiter? And so those of you on LinkedIn, let the recruiters come to you and put them through your scorecard. Uh, promote it in your wider social media, advertising and listings. I don't know if uh, you can do it on Unbiased, but I think on Vouched For, 
Uh, you could put a link to your scorecard on Vouched For as well. If you've got any referral partners or business partners, joint venture partners, tell them about it as well. Tell your professional connections about it. In fact, encourage your professional connections to actually go through the scorecard as well. If you do any blogging or articles, mention it, always mention it in there. If you do it in a podcast, mention it at the end of every single podcast that you do, every video that you do, every email or newsletter that you do. Uh, it has its own URL because it's a website in its own right. I take the URL and put that URL on your business card or create a QR code, print it on the back of your business card. Mention it in your webinars and your seminars. Every, I know some people who, mention, who encourage people to go through the scorecard during their seminars. I do it during talks now as well. I use a scorecard now out of an audience of a thousand people, I can get 1000 people to give me their data during a presentation now, which was on, in, the, in the old days, I had to collect business cards. I used to say, come up to the front, I'll give you a freebie and, I'll, get, and I'll, I'll have your business card. Now I can get them to do it willingly in the middle of a presentation. If you do any PR or you do any media, mention it there. When you're just having general conversation with your mates in the pub, tell them about your scorecard. So use it as part of your other and use it on vouch for as well. So promote the hell out of this thing as well, because I really want you to have some value. So it's not just a marketing tool, it's a valuable asset of your business. And to start to sum up, uh, let's just put some of these up on the screen. Instant value for your website visitors. They get a personalized report based on their personal situation. It is proof of your expertise. It's a lead generating tool that enables you to choose who you want to follow up, helps you to understand each person as an individual, follow up with personalized message like Mick and his wife did with his postcards and no more reliance on marketing that is running out of, out of steam. And suddenly your website starts working. And that's the cool thing about this. I've got financial advisors who are already telling me that they don't need their existing website anymore. They'll just use this instead because it gets rid of all those multiple links. It proves your expertise. It gives people something to do. Everything I was saying that is not good about websites, a scorecard is the exact opposite. Does it work? Well, it certainly works for me. Um, it certainly worked for Mick and I'm seeing financial advisors like Mike thinking of all sorts of different ways that they can use it. I did a present, a marketing workshop a couple of months back for Schroeder's Personal Wealth. I was talking about an, uh, a, a, an hour and a half on marketing, mostly about LinkedIn. Uh, and I said to everybody, look, stick around to the end because uh, I will show you how you can get a personalized assessment of how well you as a financial advisor at Schroeder's Personal Wealth are actually using LinkedIn. And I gave them the link at the end uh, and I said, I hope you find it useful. Uh, wave bye bye. We finished the webinar. I went off to make a cup of coffee. I came back 10 minutes later and there were 97 leads sitting in my inbox. 97 people. I thought this is cool enough. This is interestingly enough. This is interesting enough that they thought they'll give this a go. And they did it within 10 minutes of ending the workshop. I had 97 leads sitting in my inbox straight away. And I can go through them and I can literally pick and choose the ones that I want to follow up. Every single one of them will go on my uh, inbox in, on my newsletter list as well. If your scorecard isn't working, it's usually down to a number of things. As Mike said, you want to tweak this um, until you get it right. Usually it's not working if there's no clear theme. The more generic it is, the less likely and the less curiosity factor there will be. Um, if people are bailing out early, um, that's usually because there are too many questions or the questions are too complicated. Even if someone does bail out early and they don't finish it, you get an email as the financial advisor and say, John Smith has just started your scorecard, but he didn't finish. So you can then follow that up and say, hey, John, I hope there wasn't a technical problem. Here's a link. You can have another go and complete it. OK, tricky questions. Sometimes the look and feel isn't quite right as well. Um, or there is insufficient curiosity that's created. There's you, we can usually narrow it down to a problem uh, if, it's, if it's not working. So test it, 
go through it yourself. Uh, imagine that you are a different type of client. Go through it three or four times. Just make sure the scoring logic behind it is working um, and the results are coming out. Get your family to do it, close friends. Go to one or two existing clients and say, uh, look, this is something we're just introducing. Uh, could you give it a go and give me some honest feedback, as Mike said, and also go test it with some of your introducers as well. So, um, as a financial advisor said to me last week, she actually said, how do I get my hands on this fast? And with your permission, I would like to show you how you can get your hands on this. Four different ways. You can do it yourself. Um, if you can figure your way around an Excel spreadsheet and hook it up to your website, you could create one of these. And I've seen some financial advisors have done that over the year. There's a variety of different software packages that are available. You can create different types of scorecards and I'll be more than happy to recommend that you do that. You can do it yourself and I will train you how to do it is another way to do it. You can have a ready-made template scorecard. Um, I've got two. There's a, 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 fun, a life and pensions scorecard, which you can, so it's customized with your logo and your contact details and your regulatory statement. Um, and once you've learned how to use it, you can then customize it further if you wanna do that. Or you can do the fully bespoke one that is customized to your business like Mike has done. Here's a couple of examples of fully bespoke ones. I've taken their logos off. Uh, just so that just, just give them a bit of time with it before anybody sees them in detail. But here's one, discover your retirement readiness score. Are you financially ready for retirement? Find out in the next 10 minutes. Discover your financial fitness score. Understand, develop and see a stronger financial future. Uh, the one on the left is a template one uh, aimed at the later life um, lending market. Um, because as one or two of you may know, you know, equity release, later life lending comes with a bit of baggage, um, although it is completely transformed itself. So we've got a ready-made, could you unlock an even better retirement scorecard as well? And here's another one on the right, which was a bespoke bill, uh, build as well. And there's Mike that you've already seen. Um, your investment in this DIY, well, it's really your time. It'll take quite a long time to do. You can do it yourself with training, 195. Uh, the ready-made template ones are 499 and customized with your logo, email customization, get a copy of the book. Um, we'll train you how to do it as well. And you've got the software subscription of 29 pounds a month plus VAT. The bespoke ones are 995, where we have a consultation online. We really work closely together, try and find out what you're trying to achieve. We go through your questions and say, so we've got ready-made questions. You can do your own. We figure out the scoring logic. And as Mike discovered, that's the real key bit that we, we've got to get right. We create a custom results page that people get, copy of the book, marketing training, and you've got my personal support as well. And that's a plus the 29 pounds a month as well. For those of you that are on this call today or watching the video, I'll give you a hundred pound voucher off either of those. That's either the bespoke build or the ready-made scorecard as well. And that is valid until the 28th of May. So if that's something of, of interest to you, please just drop me a line or go to that website address and you can send a, a personalized message through there. You can watch a video uh, which says broadly what I've said here today. Um, so I hope you found that of interest. Um, Think about Mix Scorecard. This thing just worked and it was about the most simple, non-digital, old school um, marketing tool that he's ever used. Um, financial advisors that put on seminars, they quite often use a questionnaire format, but the fact that it was presented as a simple postcard with an incentive to take it, a book token, a record token, a bottle of wine, how simple is that? What the modern day scorecards are, uh, is the, is the, is this postcard on steroids, to be quite honest. So we're about done. Um, we've finished in time, which is excellent. Um, if anyone's got any questions they want to ask right now, I'd be more than happy to take them. Or if you want to ask me personally, just drop me a line or we can schedule a call and we can uh, take it from there. So if we've got any questions, 
um, shout now or forever hold your peace or drop me a line in due course. No questions right now. I can't see any coming through. Just shout if you want to. Matt's put a thumbs up, which is really nice. Thank you. Great. So we're done. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, hope you found that of interest. It's a new way of looking at marketing. I think it's a really exciting way of looking at marketing. Really changes everything um, and could be of real value to your, to your businesses. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, take care. And um, I'll make sure that each one of you gets a copy of the video in case you want to go through it slowly um, in your own time. So, th oh, and we've got another one. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. Nice to see you. Uh, and great to see everybody else. Thanks a lot, everyone.